Ich freue mich, dass wir wieder ein volles Haus haben. Und ich freue mich sehr und besonders, dass wir diese sehr äh, bekannt spielen, berühmten und äh, auch beschäftigten Herren hier hinbekommen konnten. Und dass sie sich die Zeit genommen haben, zu äh, äh, so zu kommen. Vielen, vielen Dank an Ben und an Mark, äh, dass ihr euch that you took your time to come here. Really very, very great honor for us. Um, uh, ich muss, glaube ich, nicht viel zu den, zu den Herren sagen. Uh, was für Deutschland ganz interessant ist, sind beide an der Städelschule. Der Ben van Dachel ist sogar ein Dekan an der Städelschule. Und uh, um, Mark ist für die Theorie doch uh, zuständig. Mark uh, war in 2000 schon mal hier uh, für Ungarns während der Ausstellung in der Kunsthalle in Köln haben wir eine Serie gemacht über Architekturism des 20. Jahrhunderts. Und es ist ein Vortrag, den ich immer noch in äh, wirklich wahnsinniger Erinnerung habe. The Prosthetics of Architecture es hat mich hingerissen. Deswegen freue ich mich auch, dass ich heute Abend noch mal hören darf, was äh, Mark alles für Wissen hat und wie er das Wissen zusammenbringt in, in ganz unterschiedlichen Wegen als normale, <lacht> normale Menschen es tun können. Und Ben, äh, einer der wirklich äh, Protagonisten äh, und äh, Streiter der digitalen Architektur in einer Art und Weise, die, glaube ich, sehr spannend und sehr zeitgemäß ist, äh, der äh, auch oft und viel äh, spricht in verschiedenen Situationen, äh, bin ich sehr froh, dass er uns auch heute seine Ideen über Bücher und vielleicht auch etwas wieso diese Bücher oder diese Gedanken seine Architektur beeinflussen, zeigen wird. Ich muss ganz kurz, weil wir haben ja heute Abend uns ja über Buckminster Fuller sprechen, muss ich hier meinen kleinen Magic Cube zeigen, den ich auf der Kölnmesse gefunden habe. Ja. Es ist so schön. Und zwar ist das ein kleiner Cube, der sich dann in einen Diamant verwandelt von Buckminster Fuller. Und ich habe ihn nicht widerstehen können, dachte, es ist ein ein Zeichen, wenn ich heute Abend bei Künstler Fuller habe, dass ich das auch äh, kaufen muss. Dann ganz kurz in eigener Sache, wie immer, leider, wie ich das <lacht> müssen wir unseren Freundeskreis erfahren, die noch nicht da sind, können wir Gedanken machen, ob sie äh, in unseren Freundeskreis eintreten möchten, damit wir weiterhin diese schönen Sachen machen können. Wir haben hier an der Wand eine Ausstellung äh, über Ungarns, die City Metaphors, da verkaufen wir auch das Buch, ein sehr spannender kleiner Text drin. Wir haben auch ein sehr schönes kleines Plakat gemacht, das wir auch nicht verkaufen. Und, äh, <lacht> und wir machen äh, auch sehr schöne Führungen durch, äh, die, die gut angenommen werden. Vielleicht wollte ich sie hier doch nochmal erwähnen, für die, die nicht wissen, äh, dass man sich für eine Führung anmelden kann. Die Karten liegen vorne auf, können Sie mitnehmen und anrufen. Äh, die Bücher sage ich nichts zu, den werden die Herren was zu sagen, die liegen hier und äh, die Informationen darin werden wir jetzt gleich erfahren. Und nochmals vielen Dank. And I, think, I think Ben is starting. Right? Thank you. Ein Wort. Kammerbescheinigung. Wir können nach der Veranstaltung vorne abgeholt werden. Die können wir auch schützen, wenn wir sehen. Zwei Fenster. Is, is it possible that we have to be on? Can, can oh, sorry. Can ich sage noch ein Wort. Ich muss bei dem Sponsor der FSB danken. Die haben auch Bücher, die außen vor liegen, die kann man umsonst mitnehmen. Das ist nie ein Werbebuch, sondern immer ein ganz spannendes äh, äh, Literaturbuch sozusagen. Und äh, danke, dass FSB uns so lange treu ist mit Ex Libris. Und äh, das ist eine ganz tolle Zusammenarbeit, die wir so langsam über die Jahre entwickeln. Danke. So thank you. Um, I, I maybe I book and I show the book I I'm going to indirectly and directly talk about tonight. It's uh, called The Age of the Inside by Eric uh, Kandel. Um, you might uh, think what what does have uh, a neuroscientist uh, to do with an architect? Uh, but um, but maybe my fascinate. Do you hear me in the back? No, Do you, you have to put it louder. Louder. 
Do you want me to stand up otherwise? No. That I can speak over the... <laughs> um, so, so, so uh, Kandel for me is an interesting uh, person because um, uh, he for me gave a total new insight in how we can look uh, back to the history of uh, the arts and, and the culture of uh, Vienna. Uh, in the time of uh, the beginning of the last century. And uh, what, what is interesting about Kandel is that he, um, as, a, as an, a neuroscientist, started as a young student uh, to be part of the scene, even himself there, in, in the time when you had all these salon uh, meetings <coughs> where Freud, um, Schiele, Kakoschka, um, and Klimt would all to uh, come together in, in one room. And, and, and he learned a lot from the stories around these, these scientists he was uh, working with as a student in that time. And I'll give you a more uh, better history of, of, of that what he learned and particularly later on. But what was important is that he later on, um, when he went to America, and of course, uh, later on, got uh, you know through his research as an, a neuroscientist. Although he, he wanted, because in the beginning, become an uh, an uh, psychoanalysist, <coughs> and for, for that reason, was so fascinated in the work of Freud. He later on, when when he was in America, learned that he, through the biology of the brain, could learn more of the inside of humans' behavior than 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 what he thought uh, Freud and other thinkers uh, could do before him. But let me go back to, um, to, to the way how he gave new insights, in a way how, how um, the work of Klimt and Kokosha, and especially Schiele, and also later on, how he gave, gave a new insight to the, uh, that work. Because um, you have to imagine that, of course, in that time when these scientists and artists were sitting together, that they would learn from from the theories of Freud, for instance, uh, these artists, and, and that they would talk about the theory of women, for instance, and that they, for instance, especially Klimt was, uh, was very uh, opposite the idea of the theory of Freud, because he said, you know, to Freud, listen, I mean, if, if, you, if you want to know more about women, you have to work with women. You don't work so much as with women than we do. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so and, and, and developed a whole argument around the way how um, uh, through the, 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 the dialogues he had with the women he painted um, and, and how through, let's say, the, the, the knowledge he, he gained uh, fr from also the other scientists who were uh, uh, close friends of him, how he um, um, transported these ideas of, of the unconscious and, 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 and ideas around desire and also even uh, pure biological observations who were then observed for the first time, like for instance micro, uh, um, mi micro uh, movements in, in biology were not so fully observed uh, before uh, the 19th century, but, uh, but in that time um, uh, he discovered all kinds of new patterns in biology. He transported them, for instance, towards the cloth of the women he painted, and that, actually that was not known. Uh, uh, that, that, that these artists were having that influence, let's say, uh, uh, 20 or 30 years ago. So for me, that gave me the insight that that surrealism started in Vienna. <laughs> you know, that, that maybe the idea of the unconscious and the way how, for instance, these painters were transporting um, desires and, and obscure observations to be uh, be re represented in the portraits of the people he, or they painted was for me a new way of looking at at psychology, psy uh, psychoanalysis, and the representation of um, of these of these of these desires uh, to be be uh, represented in in uh, in, the, in portraits, for, the, for instance. Whereas before, I was always thinking that if we if we think about representational tools. And, and of course, I mean, architects have had always fascinations for these representational tools. 
from using the perspective as you know and now today on uh, new computational techniques then we need to also know what we what we see in these representational tools how can you discover new layers in that and for me art has been always in science uh, i will talk about it uh, later uh, a little bit more um, for me science have had always that 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 double interest in the way how i could transport that to its uh, my work so so the work of Kandel and, and this history of, of Vienna and his own path through uh, neuroscience gave me a lot of ideas to, to my own work. And, and sorry for using my own work. Uh, normally uh, uh, in a conversation like this, I, I'd like to keep my own work out. But, 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 but it has had, over the last few years since the book, had such an interesting, uh, uh, you could say, on the one hand, retroactive uh, influence on my work, but also uh, and direct influence on my work. And, and I'll show you that in this image. Maybe you can see this as a brain. Uh, uh, but it is not, not a brain. It's actually the way how clients and, 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 and people who today are, today are a bit lost in, in asking an architect to, to come up with an idea for a building, they come to you with these questions. They, this was, for instance, for the Frauenhof Institute in Stuttgart, where the Fraunhofer Institute asked me, how could we represent the future work environment? Because nobody's going to ask us anymore in the future how we will work uh, in an office building. We will work totally different. And, and of course, it was closely related to my own fascination with working in different environments and that the typology of, the, of, of office buildings would uh, change, would be changed. So, <laughs> So the expansion of the profession and the diversity of the profession has been so much growing in so many directions, as maybe I can refer to Kandel's observations of uh, psychoanalysis and psychology in general and connected it to its neuroscience, I similarly discovered that that change in architecture as well. The expansion of the profession has been growing in, in many diverse directions. On the one hand, um, here I talk about regulations, undefined programs, where you have to reinvent the program for the client or reinterpret them. Uh, this is actually, for instance, that program of the client and gave it a new touch by talking more about laboratory spaces in a prototype office building where uh, we translated this, is, this in later on. But also the idea of the network model of the, of the brain, as, as, we, as we know, the neuro, um, um, the connections, the network neural connections in the brain, they can grow more, uh, more rapidly and, and can expand more rapidly than we have uh, known before. We thought that when we would become older, that, then th that, that system will uh, become productive, but the opposite is now proved. So, so similarly in architecture, when we talked about the network practice before, now we can talk about the expansion of the profession to its the, the knowledge practice. We can gain much more knowledge from, from other fields. And um, if I talked before a bit about the, the, the local salon and the history of local knowledge, then today we can talk about the global salon the way how over time we can now be in many times in the same time and connect ourselves to that, towards these different worlds. So I don't want to talk here about co-creation and the world of how design can be, be part of another world outside the fields where you work in alone. I'm not design, uh, saying that we can design all together on the same project, like maybe a scientist can say today that he needs to <coughs> do the research himself, but maybe he needs to gather the knowledge from outside his laboratorium in order to become sharper. In that sense, I'm interested in the way how we could experiment with knowledge in a, in a far more innovative day, uh, uh, system today, sorry, than, than before. And maybe the, the levels of participation and control and the way how one works today is, is having my fascination. And maybe on the right hand side you see also a diagram where I try to explain the increasing scale of participation related to the way how science and art is coming together in art in a kind of unusual different way than we maybe we expected. Like for instance over the last 10 to 20 years we were very comfortable to talking about fashion, 
literature, maybe cinema, uh, many other cultural effects we could bring into architecture. Whereas the scientific aspect has been sometimes a bit, uh, or the technological development of architecture has been sometimes undergoing a kind of static uh, phase. So, so going back to the salon uh, argument, I believe that today, like what Kandel, where Kandel stands for, uh, to, to broaden one's knowledge through a, a more scientific approach to its, to its the psychological, is, is there where, where I'm, I'm fascinated in. Like, for instance, if you look at this painting of the movements and the gesture of the social codes, as Kandel, uh, where Kandel talks about, he says there is more to be found in the hands of a Schiele's self-portrait, and 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 maybe something of the, the 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 difficult aspect of his self-portrait, you could say, the disturbed maybe aspect of the self-portrait, something of of so, something what what Schiele in a way wanted to portray himself. That I mean that aspect is I find so fascinating that it is not to be found in the portrait itself but that it is to be found in a larger detail of the composition of, the, of this drawing than, than the eye or the, maybe, the, the, maybe the specialness and the craziness of the hair, but it is to be found in the, in the gesture of the hands. And you, and you know what I mean when I talk about um, that here another aspect of desire disturbs fascinations um, maybe kind of uh, a kind of uh, un unhappy uh, kind of uh, stressful moment is maybe expressed in this uh, portrait is maybe already dealing with this idea of how the unconscious is portrayed within this uh, gesture of the again the gesture of the character of the of the person portrayed here so maybe I don't want to talk about an early, early surrealism but, but it is touching on that what the surrealists like Breton were, uh, later on were, were fascinated in. So, so talking about this large detail, so is that something where we in architecture can work with too? I've been thinking about it for a long time. Is it, uh, is it possible that one detail can tell the whole concept of the building? I tried once uh, with a project uh, um, uh, before I even read this book and then expanded these ideas after reading the book uh, on, on the idea of the ceiling. Could the ceiling be a guiding element what brings you into the building, what guides you from one space to the other uh, and uh, becomes on the one hand a wayfinding element but also here it represents a mirror of the typology of the context of this museum. It's a museum in Nijmegen, actually uh, you know probably Nijmegen better than, than uh, we know in Holland um, because it's, have, it's having some hills. Uh, and, um, the Dutch are always happy with every hill. You know, we, we are, so so whenever, when we, whenever we see a kind of a small movement in the landscape, we, we like to portray it. <laughs> um, so, so portraying that landscape, the top typology, and mirroring that back into the ceiling of this museum was, was the idea of gathering a public moment in, in the center of this building together with another large detail, uh, the central staircase. So these two details, they more or less bring the whole composition up there where people come together, where the, the staircase is a staircase within a staircase, and whereby you cannot always find where you have to uh, find the right way to go to the right uh, program within the building, but it guides you somewhere to, to a lower part of the museum or to a cafe or to the garderobe of the building. But again, maybe this idea of the, here in this case, the two larger details are, are bringing some public moments together in the way how it creates also a public moment uh, and, and something of the, maybe call it the mirroring effect of the of the, of the landscape outside the museum towards the museum. And there are many layers to be read in that mirroring. I, I, I can't give you all the layers, but uh, what you have to know, it's an archaeological museum and a museum for art. And, and of course, I mean, knowing Freud, uh, he was obsessed by archaeological objects and believed that, that everything in the archaeology, archaeology uh, of, of, of uh, the history of a story 
could be uh, saying something about um, that what is maybe connected <coughs> to the, the history of architecture too. Um, so here the site around the building is, is an archaeological Roman site. The Romans were actually in Holland, if you didn't know that. But that was uh, quite an interesting part of the boundary uh, area where in Nijmegen that, that archaeological context was then also mirrored back into the, in the, in, in the, into the museum uh, through this uh, ceiling as well. So it was not only the reflection of the landscape but the ar archaeological effect as well. Similarly, in, in an, maybe noted as well that, that if you look at the latest work of, um, or this, this is maybe not so uh, latest work of Freud, but uh, Lucian Freud, but in, in uh, let's say, a work what he did I earlier about himself, <coughs> um, I, I thought that, and, and being influenced by Kokoschka a lot, of course, you know that Kokoschka and uh, Lucian Freud they were actually quite close in, in the way how they, they, they were fascinated in portraying a, an inner deeper self of the way how they uh, expressed themselves in the paintings. But, but here, I, you know, I, I similarly believe that it was so fascinating to, to bring that idea of, of an image or an after image of the portrait back to this, this person for this house, similarly in the representation of the house. So, it, so maybe call it the portrait of, of the owner of the house. He's Russian. Uh, was highly fascinated in gold, um, and 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 I wanted to play with that extension of the double images you could create with this mirroring effect of the of the glass, uh, but also playing with the idea of the inner uh, philosophy of the owner's uh, um, lifestyle in the house itself. So as if you could create an image but could transport constant after images. And, and that's maybe why I'm talking about, where Kandel also talks about so much when, they, when he talks about the work of Kokoschka and Schiele, and that time where um, they, they try to portray the ideas of afterthoughts to be represented in the portraits of, of, of the, the people they painted. And uh, like, for instance, in this uh, image of Gustav Klimt where the, the eyes become almost the black hole of the face, like like and and maybe the mouth is maybe not really the black hole, but the nose, the, eye, the openings in the nose. All these ideas of the way how let's say the the the, the white or the blue wall of the face and the black hole of the openings are playing a kind of game between the way how this almost scary image <coughs> of, of this of this uh, person. Is portrayed. He is is something what, where maybe in architecture we are now far more flexible with. We 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 can stretch up forms. We can bend forms. We can open surfaces up and give new diagonal connections. Whereby maybe like in this house we can give parallax, as we can call it so nicely, double parallax, uh, as we say, parallax experiences parallax uh, relationships between a landscape experience what is echo back to the to the house itself as well i have to be careful with my time because architects can talk for hours <laughs> so um, it's okay. so so but 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 in the latest house similarly we we played with that with that idea of how how you can pull up a surface and stretch it and bend it up like once you take up a, a landscape in this ca case and then twist and turn it in many directions here the owners were fascinated in everything what has to do with the latest developments of um, new technology and, and science related to the way how this house could be used. Like the walls are all made in clay, uh, they are thick, they keep the temperature of the, 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 the heat in, so uh, the, 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 all the energy is uh, um, uh, being uh, transported in a system whereby it can be turned back into to a, near, a zero uh, uh, use of, of uh, energy in, in uh, the whole year. So this high, whole idea of the way how the bending of a surface can open up a surface towards, on the one hand, the landscape, like maybe I showed before, in, 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 the, in the house uh, where the landscape is mirrored, he similarly we play with that idea that almost the house could sometimes be turned into a painting and, and a double reading of, of 
a painting or either uh, where you see the house as a painting or not. But, but the central place is the most important, like maybe what I explained in the, in, the, in the museum in Nijmegen, where people meet, where there is a social moment, where there's something of the a collectiveness of uh, the central communication comes together, where, where suddenly you can just have a nice brief talk with, uh, with your family and then maybe uh, uh, um, uh, slowly uh, move back to your uh, own um, room. But maybe I'd like to finish here with the idea of this maybe central void space of, 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 of that what we can make in, in, in architecture. Maybe that what is absent in architecture fascinates me the most. And that is where maybe Kandel was so <coughs> where Kandel was so fascinating for me. There, there he talks the most, I find, and the best about when he talks about um, the age of the inside of that what he discovered in Viennese painters um, of the uh, modern age. So the absence of of the images uh, and the absence of the reading of that what you have to discover slowly in the work. Um, but for that, you have to all read the book itself. Thank you very much. <laughs>room uh, also with men because we have been friends for 3,000 years <coughs> so it's, it's nice to be here in in, uh, in a house basically so it's also a domestic situation so to be with a friend in a, in a house with friends fellow victims of architecture um, there is no known cure for architecture I mean we're working on it um, it's highly <laughs> contagious in families um, so still, it's always nice to be in a small room with a group of uh, victims of architecture to talk about it and to talk about books. And of, of course, for me, uh, this city is, is basically two things. Uh, the library here. Um, the last time I was in this library was maybe 15 years ago. I spent uh, time here with your mother and father. It was really very, very special. Um, was, and then there's, of course, uh, Koenig's bookstore. So the same problem. <laughs> and if, you, if you're in Koenig's bookstore and you go upstairs, you, you may as well leave your wallet uh, <laughs> upstairs. Um, here, of course, is great because you, you survive. <laughs> um, but in both cases, the, the love is the same. And, and uh, uh, in both cases, the upstairs of, of, of Koenig is the ephemera. So the, the things you could not find anywhere else because somebody else has looked for you and maybe thought that one day you would walk in and you know when you uh, buy one of those things that maybe it was already there for 15 years. Really, it waited for you for 15 years. But you know when you see it that it belongs to you. <laughs> and, and, I, and it's really a joke about the wallet because you're <coughs> incredibly happy. Um, the same is true of this, this library here where... where I, I need to find something today, and I had this strong feeling that I could, in half an hour, find it, and, and we did. Um, so, uh, and, and I was asked which which book in this library I should talk about. So I, ch I choose this one, Buxminster Fuller, um, Nine Chains to the Moon, uh, which is from 1938, um, but has also a subtitle, uh, which is called a, An Adventure in Thought. <coughs> And of course, maybe the subtitle more important than the, the title. It's always the case. I mean, for example, if, if the subtitle was not as important as the title, why would you include it? You, you include it because probably it's the really the thing that you want to say. Maybe your publisher said it cannot be the title. And you said, okay, can it, can it be the subtitle? <laughs> so, the, so the subtitle, you know, so it's an adventure in thought. So it's a book of what might be an architect understood as an adventure in thought. Also, it's adventure, not, not uh, uh, a lesson. Uh, the book is published in 1938. Um, 
the re, the re, it was the most, when I bought this book, it was the most expensive book I ever bought. And I was really, really happy. Um, and it was, my one is like this, exactly like this. And then later, the most expensive book I bought was the same book with the, with the cover um, in, in not so good condition. And then later, the most expensive book I bought was this book with a really perfect uh, cover. <laughs> So, really, we need a couch. Uh, since you're talking about Vienna, we need a couch to explain why, <laughs> why this uh, But I'm not the only one that needs a couch. Also, Fuller needs a couch because the, the only reason this book was published is that he was an alcoholic. Um, and actually, the story of architects and alcohol is, remains untold, uh, but surely important. Not, not as important as architects and coffee because no coffee, no architecture. <laughs> it's very clear. Im Im imagine if a, a meteor hits the earth, okay, maybe half of us will die, but life will rebuild. But you remove caffeine from this planet, it's the end of our, it's, the, it's absolutely the end of our species. And, and certainly the end of Arctic. So, so he was a very big drinker. He, uh, and he would drink with the writer Christopher Morley. And, and Morley was, of course, uh, had his own magazine and was a really important uh, literary figure. And Christopher Molly pers persuaded Lippincott, the publisher, to, to, to publish this book. A, a book that Fuller always wanted to publish. Actually, he, he was always looking to publish a book. He always had ideas about a book. He always had friends that were trying to persuade publishers to publish. And the publishers were always very polite, but in the end they wouldn't publish it. This, because this is a man, but Mr. Fuller, that, for example, wrote one sentence that it is an entire book. One sentence, the epic poem on industrialization. So he's not an ordinary uh, 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 writer. Um, and it's not his, his first book, because the publishers will not publish it, he publishes his own book. He self-publishes a book in 1928. So first, maybe we talk a little bit about this book, and then I can describe a little bit what the book is that comes before. Uh, there's no uh, uh, architecture in the book. Uh, so, uh, there are two images, uh, are very important, which I will describe, and two questions. The two questions are, what is man, and what is a house? And this question, this question, those are the titles of two chapters at the beginning, and they're always through the book, he's, uh, he's trying to answer these uh, uh, questions. And um, basically, to give you the answer... <laughs> What, what is a man? He describes a man as a, uh, as a machine. So he describes every part of the human body as a, as a kind of a mechanism. So a man is like this uh, ma machine. And then this machine continues out into the world through technology. So the human, the man is not just a fleshy body, but is also a mechanical body full of electricity and mechanisms and, 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 and so on. Um, and, and continues, he keeps going and going and going. And this, this, this man, this, this uh, thing, uh, even the body of the man is a technology, like uh, any other technology. He used to say always, for example, if I was him in this room, he would always say, I'm really happy to be back in this room, but actually the only part of me that has returned to the room are my glasses and my name, neither of which I was born with. Everything else, all the billions of cells have been replaced. So what has come back to the room is the idea of me. And it is the idea of me that is the real me. So yes, I'm here, but I'm not here because of my body. I'm here because of uh, what he called the phantom captain. So the phantom captain is running all of this technology. Uh, it's a kind of a ghostly uh, uh, captain. And, and so the answer, what is man? Man is a phantom captain extended with technology, starting with the body, then electricity and so on. And the very first technology is the word, language, the first tool. So the moment you are human is the moment you are using technology, which is also the moment you are using language. So he's coming from that uh, uh, tradition in, in thinking about technology that says that technology is what makes the human human. It's the most human thing about us. What makes us different from other species is that we have technology. So technology is not an alien about to attack us. It is, it is us. Um, so, so he answers the question, what is man like this? The phantom captain. And he gives this long explanation of all of the uh, 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 operations. 
And then the final conclusion, what, what, what is the house, finishes in the last chapter, which is in which uh, a man with a radio set accidentally tunes in to a signal coming from the other side of the universe, and this woman, <coughs> an, an Exion, arrives on Earth and says, hey, what did you just do? And he says, I just was playing with my radio set, and you arrived here. And she said, ah, yes, because yeah, she, she comes from a much more superior uh, place. And anyway, as a woman, of course, <laughs> by, by definition, she's already from another place and, and uh, infinitely more sophisticated. And she, said, she, says, um, she says, ah, yeah, yeah, you have a radio set. Yeah, well, we discovered that, that the ultimate dwelling system is a radio beams, that you, you, that you live in radio. So the final answer to the question, uh, what is a house, is, 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 is radio. And of course, uh, uh, of course, the phantom captain is radio too. The human being is a ra radio signal. Right? So this is the sort of a narrative. So you understand why publishers would not say yes. Okay, fine. <laughs> uh, but the first, the, this is the first image which you see, and maybe you can look at the book afterwards. But it's an image of the, it's a, it's an image of the world. But you see the way he's gone. The world is uh, as one island. So he's changed the way, and this is Fuller's greatest uh, ability, is to, is to help you to see the world differently. Right? So for example, he, he, a minimum lecture for him was six hours. That's what he called a mini lecture. Uh, a serious lecture is more like 12 hours. Uh, people would uh, <coughs> listen to him, go out, have a meal, and come back. He'd still be going. The, the longest lecture he ever gave was 42 hours. Uh, the lecture was called, What Do I Know? Everything I Know. <laughs> And, and the, the rule was he should not repeat himself, so he went 42 hours. <laughs> anyway, at the end of one of these six-hour mini-lectures, a student said, Mr. Fuller, sir, it's just fantastic. Uh, you, I loved your lecture. Do you believe in, light, in life in outer space? And he says, young man, where the hell do you think you are? <laughs> <laughs> so so it, was a, it was a really a brilliant figure at changing changing the way you, you see things. He's the first person to really insist on ecology as the central concept of, uh, uh, of life. He was against politics. He argued that politics is just uh, based on the false assumption that there is not enough resources in the planet. So you need politicians to negotiate to make sure you're the one that has resources and therefore you need warfare to make sure that there's, uh, the resources come to you. And he says it's completely wrong. <coughs> of course, if we only could distribute the resources properly, everybody, there's enough for everybody. So these are, of course, ideas that anybody at the age of, uh, let's say, 15 or 16 years old today believes uh, deeply. So Fuller is an important person, an important reference point for the idea that we could share the planet by being just more intelligent with uh, resources. So presenting the world as one island is, the, is a highly political drawing suggesting that we live in one place, no political boundaries, one island, so we could just under, try to understand how to distribute the resources. The last illustration, which I open with some care, uh, but maybe you could look at it later. This will be kind of exercise of frustration, because you're not going to be able to see it. <laughs> anyway, it's a, it's a huge drawing of the history of technology. Uh, and I really invite you to, to look at it. I, I would be a little, I wouldn't. No, I'm just going to take this part, you take that one. I think it's still, no, okay. it's yours. <laughs> so, so it's a chart of the, it's just a chart of the history of technology. Here are all the different technological inventions. These are the uses of resources and so on. And this is panic, 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 panic. <laughs> These are when we didn't really, and it's what's all about the exponential growth in the prosthetic capacity of the human but also the traumas that each of these technologies are, 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 are accompanied by. And um, a, lot of the, a lot of the charts are to do with, uh, with copper, with the use of copper. I mean, when people think of sharing resources, normally they are thinking about water, food, and these kinds of things, energy. And he was thinking about copper. And basically, his, his, he had a lot of knowledge about copper. He was one of the experts in the, in the total amount of copper being used on the planet. And he was very interested in the fact that so much copper was used in so much wires that were covering the planet 
But if we didn't have to use those wires anymore, there would be enough resources left in the copper that we are not using to deal with all of the other problems. So we had a kind of a copper theory. Um, but also it's a kind of anti-wire theory. It's a wireless theory. So you understand that if, if, the house, if the house is really radio, if it's really signals, if the real site for architecture is the electromagnetic spectrum, not a physical space, then wireless and radio is actually the beginning of the possibility of sharing resources and of treating each other with dignity and, 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 and so on. So r radio for Fuller was really, let's say, the, the, it was a kind of a word for um, thought. And, we, and thought itself was, was intelligent. By, by the way, he felt like we all were our brains, getting back to Kandel. Um, it, all of our brains are like little radio transmitters. So he thought instead of politics, you would have satellites that could tune into the brain waves and you would simply ask a question like, should uh, we care about Ukraine? And if all of us said yes in our thoughts, the satellites would go like, everybody says yes. So that would be the decision. <laughs> so it would be based on a, on, a, on a kind of, so you had this very, very strong bottom-up sort of hyper-democratic uh, uh, impulse. On the other hand, almost all of his projects were done with major military and governmental organizations. So the standard criticism of Fuller is that he's a kind of technocratic, top-down, I know the answer to your problem kind of guy. But the people who argue that correctly don't, don't pay attention to the, to the sort of radical democratic uh, view that he held. So this is a little bit why I like this book. So this book is, is, gets in, it has long, long chapters about, for example, the British and how the British thought that they were ruling the world when they controlled the maps of where resources move. So it's a, it's a highly political book. But in the end, it's the purpose of all this politics is to try to make space for the space of, the, of, of radio based on, on the idea of doing the most for the least, which will be known as Dimaxian. Uh, um, and it will be known as Dimaxian because he designed a house that was exhibited in 1931-32 in a, in a department store in Chicago. And the public relations man of the department store said, you can't call it the 4D house, which was his name for it. It's just not sexy. Uh, tell me about your theory. So Fuller, of course, spent a few hours. And, <laughs> and the guy said, OK, I've got it, Dimaxian. Mean, you know, to do the most with the least. So it became Dimaxian. So what I wanted to do is show you just very, very quickly um, some of the images from the book that he published himself in 1928, um, which is really, let's say, the, the kind of design philosophy that relates to this more or less this political philosophy in uh, Nine Chains of the Moon. This is full of, <coughs> it's one of my favorite images of him because he appears to be, um, I mean, actually, the more you look at it, I never noticed that there are only, yeah. it's just sort of a strange hand if you think about it. But he was basically, in com he was completely deaf. So really this gesture that he's showing you comes from him going like this and then like that. And he used to turn off his hearing aid because if he had his hearing aid on, he would hear what you were saying. <laughs> uh, he was also, he was also, um, and, and normally you see, you almost always see Fuller surrounded in his geometry. So living in his geometry. So always suspended. So on the left, he's actually inside the very first dome he ever made in Black Mountain College, 1949. Um, and you see him sort of, I love the image, he's kind of wistfully wondering what he has managed to uh, accomplish. And on the right he's up in the space frame in, in the Museum of Modern Art, um, suspended up there again, um, in a kind of complete networked environment. And of course the reason he's producing this kind of geometry is that this is as strong as it can be with as little as material as possible. His dream is that it would disappear. He's writing about the inevitable future is an invisible architecture, which would be an architecture of, of, of uh, radio. This is his first architecture. Uh, it's, uh, but once again, he's inside it. Uh, uh, and he made this space for his sister. 